the epistle given to us for this second mass of Christmas Day is taken from St. Paul's letter to Titus, chapter 3, verses 4 to 7. Beloved, when the goodness and kindness of God our Savior appeared, not by reason of good works that we did ourselves, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the bath of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Ghost, whom he has abundantly poured out upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior, in order that justified by his grace, we may be heirs in the hope of life everlasting in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Holy Gospel. <clears throat> is a continuation of St. Luke, chapter 2, verses 15 to 20. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. At that time, the shepherds were saying to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And when they had seen, they understood what had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard marveled at the things told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept in mind all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, even as it was spoken to them. These are the words of today's Holy Gospel. This second Mass today for me is for the poor souls in purgatory requested by Maria Kunkel. So here we are, Christmas 2018. May God bless you all with a very merry, holy, and safe Christmas. And I will happily contribute to your Christmas blessings by remembering you all as I did in my first Mass and you will have uh, in my intentions, my orations, uh, all the rest of the Masses, this one and the next one down at St. Paul's. So that's three Masses for all of you. With all of these graces I expect to see some improvement. Fewer confession lines and so forth, all right? Well, I mean, we wish that's the way it works, but it doesn't. So. But just keep up the good work, and I will try to help. There is down there by the bookstore a uh, little stocking, so if you can drop something in there to help take care of all of the expensive poinsettias, but we're glad to use them anyway. And even if you don't put in, we're still going to put them up there, but it helps us out. Thanks to the servers for all of their preparation. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, dedication to this. To the choir for all of their many, many practices. And everybody who has helped to clean and organize and carry and just help us pick things up. It looks beautiful, and we're very happy to have a high mass, and we hope that you are too. <coughs> Excuse me. Every Christmas, when I start getting ready to write the sermon, and I probably told you this last year, I'd get a phone call from mom. Honey, please give the people a sweet sermon for Christmas. They want to be happy. Okay. Well, ordinarily I listen to mama when she talks to me. I try to obey, <clears throat> but I usually don't do it very fast just to let her know, remind her that I'm grown up now. 
and I don't have to obey. In any case, <clears throat> I always feel that sermons should have a little bit of a bite to them, a little challenge to our soul to let us know that we're still not the best that we can be. There's still work to be done and that this world is still not a good place and our sins are responsible for that. So that gives you a little bit of an indication of this sermon. She probably wouldn't be happy with it. But the good thing is, is that after Mass, there was always chocolate donuts, and that made her happy. So I hope you all have many chocolate donuts in your future <clears throat> with some of these sermons. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. I will start off by asking you this question. Did any of you choose to be born? Of course not. Only one man ever deliberately chose life. The rest of us are born into life through no willing of our own. Our Lord Jesus Christ alone willed to be born into this world. He chose his own mother, his own foster father, and the place and the time and all the other circumstances of his birth. He even chose his own name. His mother and father were not permitted to choose his name. That was given to them from heaven. He chose the way of his life and the pattern of his living. He chose where he was going to die, how he was going to die, the time that he was going to die, the very second everything was decided by him before he was even born. All that he chose is good. And of course it must be so because it is God himself making these choices. There is much more we could say about this person, Jesus Christ. But just this is enough for us never, ever, ever again to consider him just an ordinary person. The best man among good men. He is far more than that. We could never say enough about him. Let us not ever mix the profane with the holy. That is an ancient piece of wisdom. Never mix the profane, the worldly, with the holy. Today, Protestantism, the Novus Ordo system, all of that is mixed together. It's horrible. Horrible. You see at some of these bookstores, giant erasers, and they have on there, Jesus erases your sins. You see what I'm talking about, mixing the profane with the holy? It's silly. It's trite. T-shirts and sweatshirts that say, I love coffee, I love naps, I love Jesus. Mixing the profane with the holy. You cannot mix Jesus Christ with any other human being. Because he's not a human being, he's a divine person. Now human life itself must be good. Or else he whose birthday we celebrate on Christmas Day would not have chosen it for his own. It must be worth living, or he would not have willed to live it. Human life must be capable of great happiness and joy, or he, whose existence is pure joy, could not have united himself so intimately with it. Human beings must be good, or at least capable of great good, or he, who is goodness itself, could not have made himself one of us. If one were to begin to study the history of the human race, the human history, starting at the beginning with the Old Testament and observing the origin of all races and nations and empires up to our present days, one would see truly horrible, horrible periods of human suffering. Human life cheapened 
and human happiness of little importance. In the first two wars of modern times, World War I and World War II, it seems that the whole world was organized to kill and destroy. Using all the genius of their respective nations to help their purposes succeed. The people were whipped up emotionally into frenzies, helping this terrible plan, sacrificing themselves and their children for war. But notice, Never has such energy and determination been applied for positive construction and holiness and happy living. Even today, here and in many parts of the world that consider themselves and are called civilized and first world countries, human nature reaches depths of savagery almost unbelievable. The suffering and the misery of millions and millions, the snuffing out of so many young lives, bright with promise. How many millions and millions, uncountable, of the unbaptized aborted. All of these make us wonder at times if, after all, life is even worth living. And then there is the fear of even greater agonies that may come upon us that makes us ask ourselves if, after all, human life was made only for self-destruction. At the Christmas crib, we must learn, first of all, a new confidence in the goodness of life, in the goodness of man, in the goodness and the happiness for which man was born. We must learn all over again that every child is wonderful, who was born in the image of the God child in the manger. That every mother is holy and every mother's life is noble who brings into this world another to live the life of Christ whom Mary bore. That every worker, every father, every man has a dignity like St. Joseph's. No one is to be considered cheap. We must learn all over again that somehow, somewhere, deep in all human beings, is at least a dim reflection of the lovable goodness of the child of Bethlehem. If mankind could learn that, it would be the beginning of the end for some of the truly horrible and satanic crimes of the 19th, 20th, and 20th centuries, such as abortion, communism, unjust wars. We're not even talking yet about spiritual destruction. But even if these were gone, the world would still not be as the good God had planned it. And all because he came unto his own and his own received him not. There is the problem. He comes to us, he comes to the Jews, he comes to all men, and we don't care about it. We don't really do anything about it. It doesn't matter to us too much. But there is a good thing. As many as received him, he did give them the power to become sons of God. And those who are sons of God are the ones that can only reform this world. Because they are working with Jesus Christ. So this is the gift, and it's the goal of the divine child in the manger. This is what he gives us, a gift to be shared with him, a goal to be reached with him. The worthwhileness of his earthly life he offers us, and his companionship, and his closeness through life. In the secret prayer of the very first Mass of Christmas Day, Holy Mother Church gives us this petition to God. She has us ask, that through this holy interchange of gifts, we may be found like unto him who has united our human nature with divinity. Or to put it more clearly, as St. Augustine usually does in his genius, he says God became man so that we could become as God. What does this mean, likeness to him? It means goodness. 
If we are like to God, that means we are good. We are all meant to be good. In fact, the word good comes from God. Union with him in life, well, that results in wisdom and joy and holy living. This is what we are all striving for. And then union with him in death and after death, well, that's the success and the crown and the reward of holy living. You only get this from living holy. People all over the world are wishing each other peace and joy on this Christmas day as well they should. But if their notion of peace and joy is not based on the reason for God becoming man, as we've seen, then it is only worldly joy and worldly peace. And like all things in this world, they won't last for long, about as long as the wrapping around the present. If this is the only kind of peace and joy that you are hoping for yourself, that you are wishing for others today, then you don't understand Christmas, and you don't understand the gift of life, and therefore you won't be of much help in making our world a better place. Because it's only when we keep Christ in Christmas, and we keep Mass in Christmas, and we keep Christ in our daily lives, that we will be a blessing to others and bring real peace and real joy to all mankind. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.